Good morning. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Delivery Team and Partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar, Sagebrush Step Treatment Evaluation Project, Summary of Short-Term Results, presented by Jim McKeever from Oregon State University. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that you may ask questions of the speaker or me at any time during the webinar by typing them into the questions pane of your control panel at the top right of your screen. I will keep most questions for Jim in the queue to field to him after the presentation, but if you have a clarifying question about a particular slide or statement, feel free to ask at any time and I'll let Jim know. I will show up in your questions pane as the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, but it's really me. I would also like to let you know that whenever, whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation. So you are welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Jim McKeever is an ecologist at Oregon State University in Corvallis and is the coordinator for the Sagebrush Step Treatment Evaluation Project. He conducts research on ants, butterflies, and on arthropod predator-prey relationships. His work in natural resources includes research on ecological effects of post-fire logging, and he has also directed two large research projects on the environmental effects of other management practices, the National Fire and Fire Surrogate Study from 2000 to 2010, and the Sage Step Study from 2005 to present. Welcome, Jim, and thank you for presenting today. Thanks, Jeannie. Right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, attending this uh, presentation about the uh, Sage Step Project. Um, before I get going, I want to acknowledge the funding for the project, uh, which uh, originally was a joint, sire, joint fire science program, which was really the first six years of research setting up all the, uh, the treatments and the, uh, the study sites. And then the uh, monitoring uh, since about 2011 has been funded by the um, Bureau of Land Management principally and also by the National Interagency Fire Center. And we did get a small shot of funds from the uh, Great Northern LCC. And uh, as you're going to see, this is, a, this is a huge project. And uh, there's no way I can cover even a, a majority of the results. So I'm going to you know, give you a sample of short-term results. And we're talking three to four years post-treatment. You know, the study started in 2005. Uh, we implemented treatments in 06, 07, and 08. And so you know, this project covers measurements taken through 2012, which is up through um, you know, four post-treatment years. Uh, I want to also mention that um, all this information uh, in various forms is posted on the, our website, sagestep.org. And if you look on that website, uh, newsletter number 21 um, is, uh, features much of this information. It was, um, that newsletter was uh, published last spring. And then uh, uh, upcoming this year, in about the middle of the year, we should be seeing our special issue for rangeland ecology and management. And uh, you're going to see a lot of papers, a lot of uh, figures and tables that, are, uh, that have uh, citations linked to this special issue. And uh, that uh, has yet to be published, but uh, most of those are in review or in press with that journal. And about a dozen papers should be coming out soon. I want to make a disclaimer uh, right off the bat. Um, this is uh, this is research, and before it's um, before we really feel comfortable in uh, putting our information out, we like to see it peer reviewed. Most of the information is, is peer reviewed, or is certainly on the, on its way to becoming that way. But occasionally, if I uh, note something that's unpublished. Uh, uh, that information should be should always be be uh, treated as uh, preliminary. All right, the uh, collaborators for this project are just about everybody involved in the Great Basin. Uh, the five universities on the left, the uh, research institutions, the federal research institutions, just to the right of that, 
uh, the management agencies, just to the right of that, and, uh, and then the, uh, the funding agencies uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, so representatives uh, uh, participate in the project from, from all of those um, institutions. And this is, I'm not going to go over this list uh, uh, really in detail, but um, you can refer to it any time. All these people are listed one way or the other on our website. Uh, but these are other principal investigators on the top and our other key support personnel on the bottom. Sage Step is really two experiments and uh, covering this what we call Sage Cheat, which is treeless sagebrush step dominated by Wyoming Big Sage and uh, it's a herbaceous understory. And then the uh, shrubland, um, shrublands that have been encroached by woodlands which is a little bit higher up in a precipitation. So we're talking, oh, 8 inch on the low end, maybe up to 10 or 11 in the sage cheat study, and maybe between about uh, 10 or 11 and 14 for the woodland study. First, the, the woodland study. Um, the issue is pinion juniper encroachment, and most people know about that. You can see the photograph on the right, and uh, this is from the Shoshone Mountains, taken by Robin Tausch. And you can see the, uh, the infilling that has occurred uh, in the 32 years between 73 and 05. Uh, not much recruitment during th that time, but just the trees are just getting bigger and appropriating more and more of the space. The, uh, uh, a map uh, from eastern, uh, showing eastern Nevada, um, you can see the, um, the extent of the landscape that we expected back in 03. Uh, to be encroached within the next 20 years in red and uh, in yellow uh, slightly less risky, but you can see that the problem is, uh, is continuing. One of the biggest problems we have, uh, among other things, is that the uh, woodland encroachment alters the fire regime, so you get increased intensity uh, in these woodland areas when they do burn, uh, but they don't burn very frequently because the fuel beds uh, aren't continuous. Uh, due to the fact that the uh, overstory of trees uh, inhibits any uh, undergrowth. The treatments that um, managers have been using over the years um, to, um, to deal with this problem um, uh, are, are the following. Uh, prescribed fire, standard replacement prescribed fire, where we attempt to take out the, the tree overstory. Uh, and it, of course, takes out any woody vegetation, uh, like shrubs. Chainsaw cutting, in, in, in our case, we just cut and leave, uh, not necessarily a management treatment, but it certainly uh, gives us an opportunity to look at the response of that understory. And then the bull hog on the left lower, which is a management treatment used commonly nowadays, which, uh, which shreds the trees uh, um, and leaves a, uh, a special kind of fuel bed on the ground. Uh, and that's a bull hog uh, machine there, and it's in for our experiment in Utah only. And then the control where we do nothing and you can see sort of the problem there with the understory pretty much devoid of any herbaceous or, or shrub uh, component in that phase two to phase three woodland. All right, the other experiment, I'll call it sage cheat experiment, um, deals with uh, cheatgrass invasion and which really is, a, uh, is the big culprit here. If you look at the photographs on the right, the upper photograph is a fairly healthy sagebrush step with a, a healthy sagebrush and in a, a diverse uh, high cover uh, component of uh, perennial, native perennial bunch grasses in the understory. Uh, perhaps a bit of uh, cheatgrass in there, you can't really see much of it, but undoubtedly there, there is some in there. But it contrasts greatly with what you see below in the photograph on the bottom right which is a sagebrush overstory with, uh, with nothing but cheatgrass in the understory. And uh, we are, in Sage Step, we're working with the above system, maybe a sort of a cross between those two. We, we looked for um, communities where we had an intact overstory of sagebrush with a mix of herbaceous in the understory, uh, that being a mix of uh, cheatgrass and native perennial bunch grasses. We want to try to see how the release uh, by, by removing woody vegetation, how um, the extra 
who's going to gain the extra resources? Is it going to be the cheatgrass component or the native perennial bunches grass component? Um, if you look on the map on the left, uh, again, it's the entire Great Basin. You see the, uh, the projections from 03 as to which areas were most risky of being invaded uh, and completely taken over into sort of that uh, situation in the bottom right. Um, and uh, the biggest problem, of course, is that once that, uh, once that uh, community in the bottom right burns, which it eventually will, uh, it leaves a monoculture of cheatgrass uh, because the shrubs don't come back. And so uh, you would regard that photograph in the lower right as an extremely unstable situation and very difficult to deal with from a management perspective. So we want to prevent that from happening as much as we can. The treatments managers use when they occasionally do treat a uh, fairly healthy sagebrush step is a stand replacement prescribed fire where you're trying to take out uh, as much of the shrub component as you can to release the understory. Um, mowing, which in our case uh, we were aiming for about 50% reduction in cover uh, by simply reducing the height of the, of the sagebrush uh, and therefore getting about, you know, arriving at about a 50% cover estimate. And then herbicide where we apply aerially and uh, over the uh, entire plot and we attempt to get about 50% um, reduction in cover. And then we have a control in the lower right where we, where we do nothing. In addition, in our plots, our uh, sagebrush, sage cheat experiment plots, the plots are huge, 50 to 200 uh, acres, um, and we apply all of the treatments I just talked about over the entire plot. Um, with the plateau or a Mazepic, we apply plateau only in one half of our measurement subplots within each big plot, including the control. And that plateau is applied in order to depress uh, cheatgrass, of course. It's applied by hand spraying, and um, and uh, it is a, a fairly important um, nested treatment within these plots. So about half the subplots get the plateau, about half of them don't. So we can compare. All right. So the, one of the questions you can ask with an experiment like this is, you know, can treatments alone improve the balance between cheatgrass and native perennial bunch grasses? If you assume for a moment that the native perennial bunch grass uh, community is really the key to the system, if we've got that, um, we can be confident that we can hold on to a, to a site at least for a while. But um, we can't afford to, uh, to seed and across great landscapes, but we might be able to afford to apply these, these bigger landscape level treatments. So that's a primary question. And high quality information on the effects of, of our treatments, the ones I just described, um, high quality information has been lacking. And that's primarily because traditional science typically is designed by scientists. It's a single site, few disciplines, small plot, and short term. In the small plot, you have a limited coverage of invasion gradients. In other words, uh, you don't have um, big enough plots to look at you know, how these communities respond when the balance of cheatgrass versus uh, native bunch grasses is, uh, varies markedly uh, across uh, your large plot. Well, Sage Step is designed collaboratively. It was designed in 2003, 4, and 5 um, using a collaboration between scientists and managers. So managers helped us understand which treatments to apply and which variables to measure. Um, a sage step is multi-site, and uh, we can judge conditional response this way. If we look at uh, a couple dozen sites, we might get a better idea than if we just look at one site. Many disciplines, it's a multivariate study, um, and so we can look at you know, trade-offs and a whole ecosystem response. And again, it's a large plot covers invasion gradients, and I'm going to talk about that in a little while later and show you a map of what I mean by that. And long term, uh, by the end of this uh, summer, we will have measured out six years post-treatment for all of our sites. Um, 
And that contrasts with the three to four years post-treatment data I'm going to cover today. So in a year from now, we should, uh, we should be getting um, a, a better idea of what's going on uh, at the six-year mark. And we're hoping to uh, push the study out to the 10-year mark. Uh, and I suppose that will be probably out to about 2019. So the multi-site aspects. Here you can see a, a map covering most of the Great Basin. You can see our sites are distributed across a very wide geographic area. If you look at the orange symbols, triangles and circles, those are the sage cheat sites. And if you look at the green symbols, they're diamonds and uh, stars and asterisks, those are our um, woodland sites. And when we do this, um, we can, uh, if we look at uh, the system like this, we can explore a conditional response. And we can also get better site-specific information. And uh, I want to point out one other thing about this map, and that is the red circles indicate uh, intensive wildlife, uh, you know, essentially avian research areas. And then the, um, the, the rectangles, uh, you know, specifically, say, at Castlehead, uh, uh, the, and at Marking Corral, you can see peeking out between the two labels. Those are our hydrology sites. Sage Step is multidisciplinary, so we study veg and fuels, soils, uh, wildlife, specifically uh, sagebrush obligate passerine birds, biodiversity, specifically butterflies, ants, and spiders, uh, hydrology, uh, and you know, sediment transport and uh, runoff. Uh, the economics, both of, uh, from the BLM's perspective and also ranching economics, and socio sociology, in particular the acceptance and trust levels that the public has with um, this kind of work. When you look at systems ecologically from a multivariate point of view, you can explore interactions and relationships amongst various components of the system. And you can also assess trade-offs that are so important for managers when they decide um, exactly what they should do with a given, a given site. And I'm going to talk about those, both those things today. Okay, let's look at this uh, invasion gradient concept. This is a single one of our 70 plots distributed uh, at those um, 20 sites throughout the Great Basin. This is Greenville Bench Burn Plot down in south, the, uh, south central Utah. And it's about a, this is a small plot, it's about 20 acres. If you look at the NAEP image that is behind that uh, rectangle, you can see the variation in tree density. And you can also see that if you look at the squares with this uh, solid circle in the middle, those are measurement subplots. That's where we take all our measurements. Those are 0 0.1 hectare measurement subplots. And if you look at those, you can see that the, um, some of those measurement subplots cover areas where there aren't very many trees. That would be phase one. Some of them uh, are uh, cover areas that are really thick in trees. Those might be phase three. The point is that those uh, squares, there are 15 of them in that rectangle, those squares cover a significant invasion gradient. And that means that when we burn that whole plot, it means we can look at the, uh, the difference in how the herbaceous plant community and other variables respond when we remove the trees in those subplots. And that's a very important uh, part of this, uh, of this uh, study because it means that if we can provide that kind of information to managers, it means that they can look on a whole hill slope or a landscape and uh, understand a bit more about uh, how the particular mix of phase one, two, and three uh, woodlands uh, is going to fare when they apply their management treatments. I also want to call your attention to some of the other aspects of this, um, of this map. The uh, capital B is a bird point count. The three S's are soil sampling stations. And uh, the, um, the, the crosses that are circle Crosses are soil sampling and soil moisture and weather stations. 
and the dash line is a butterfly transect. And so we're conducting all of this work together in these same plots, which allows us to combine the information and look at those interactions and trade-offs. Now, if you take those data, so I'm going to take the, the data from that map you just saw and put it on a graph, and the, with the x-axis being tree cover, and the y-axis being the percent understory cover. You could see the tree cover on that map on the slide before. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the triangles represent the subplots you saw in the map uh, just before. So look at the triangles on this graph. And you can see that some of the triangles are high tree cover triangles. And they always have le relatively low understory covers whereas the low tree cover triangles have high understory covers. This relationship between, this inverse relationship between tree cover and understory cover is a competitive dynamic and it is, um, we have this relationship essentially for every single one of our plots in the sage step study of our woodland plots. Um, so it is a basic uh, a fact that as trees encroach they eliminate everything else, which, which is really why uh, we have problems. So my uh, the, the beauty of this is that if we look at a potential understory cover threshold, uh, we're searching for these thresholds. So for example, if we're measuring triangles across that landscape and anything that is uh, underneath that threshold bar uh, for example, the triangle that's just above 42% tree cover and only about 10% understory cover, we may expect that triangle uh, will not respond very well. In fact, it may not recover because there's no understory there to really uh, initiate a recovery. Whereas the triangles that were within the uh, gray-blue uh, threshold bar, we have some uncertainty as to what those triangles might do. But the triangles above the bar for that burn plot, when we remove the trees, we expect them to recover. And so we might expect that those, uh, when we measured post-treatment, those, all those triangles would, would suddenly go up in understory cover because the trees have been removed and the competitors are gone. However, down on the right-hand side, we're not sure. And that's the beauty of the experiment. We can evaluate all along that gradient. And so we apply these uh, treatments over the entire, so the mechanical would be the bull hog, and the fire would be the prescribed fire in the upper left, and we'd leave the controls alone, and we'd see what happens to all these measurement subplots. All right. Now, let's start with uh, treatment effectiveness. Um, oftentimes, we wonder whether our treatments are even effective at a, at, um, you know, reaching the prescriptions that we uh, that we come up with, and I'm going to show you some information from our Stansbury site uh, over in uh, South Central Utah. Really, what we're interested in, among other things, is fire severity reduction in the future. So, if we conduct a prescribed burn like this one, will we get some benefits in fire severity reduction if a wildfire were to burn here in the future? So. This particular prescribed burn was one of the uh, 18 that we did, and it was at the Stansbury Mountain site in late August 2007. It was one of our best prescribed burns. We got 100% tree mortality, 95% shrub mortality, and 90% surface fuel consumption. And you can see that in the photograph. A year later, this is what it looked like in the burn plot. Pretty good. Bunch grasses had been set back a bit. They were a little less uh, smaller in stature than they were the year before, but they're coming back nicely. And I will say at this particular site, we didn't have a lot of cheatgrass that came back. You don't see too much of it here this particular year. So it was a very good burn, very good effect. Unfortunately, then, in late July 2009, so that's two years after the prescribed burn and one year after the photograph you're looking at now, the big pole fire burned through all of our Stansbury plots, including the prescribed burn plot. 
And this is what it looked like across that landscape in the western Stansbury Mountains. The bull hog plot is in the foreground, cut and leave is in the background, and the burn is behind you. And this is one month after the 2009 Big Pole wildfire. If you look at those data loggers, uh, we had nine data loggers in the control bull hog and cut and leave treatments, and they were all destroyed. But the three data loggers in the prescribed burn treatment that you saw in the previous photograph survived and are currently operational which was the first indication that fire severity may have been less, may have been lower in that prescribed burn plot. Then when Bruce Rowney went uh, back to the site in 2010, so this is uh, one year after the 2009 Big Pole wildfire, three years after the Stansbury treatments, he wanted to see what the response, uh, what the cover loss was of the vegetation. He knew that there would be a lot of mortality because of the Big Pole wildfire, but he wanted to see how that mortality compared uh, amongst the treatments for the different functional groups. If you look at uh, perennial grass on the left, you can see that the lowest um, cover loss, less than 10%, was the prescribed burn. There was more than double the cover loss in both mechanical treatments, the cut treatment and the shredding treatment. And that's the blue and the red. So the green is less than half of those two. And then the in the control, it's just about double the mortality in the control compared to the burn. But the control was better off than the mechanicals. And this is probably because all that fuel is on the ground. We left those uh, trees cut on the ground and then we shredded all that material. So even though the uh, intensity of fire may not have been very high in the bull hog plot, for example, because the nature of the fuel bed was really down on the ground, we, get, we must have gotten a lot of smoldering combustion, which uh, got down in there and cooked the soil and basically caused a significant amount of mortality in the perennial, perennial grasses. Same thing with the shrubs, same pattern, except in this case, the cover loss for the control was greater than the two mechanicals but the burn is, is much lower. And then in the cheatgrass uh, component, we, uh, we got a similar kind of result with the control and the burn being about the same, and, uh, but about t double the mortality of cheatgrass in the uh, mechanical treatments. And so this is evidence that there were uh, vegetational differences. Uh, you know, fire severity as measured by vegetation mor mortality uh, was much greater uh, in the control and in the two mechanical treatments as compared to the prescribed burn treatment. And again, the prescribed burn conducted two years before the 2009 wildfire. So you might think in this particular case, if I were to you know, talk about the, the bull hog treatment as a nice uh, good way to get rid of trees, you might say, well, it has this uh, downside as the fire gets in there and cooks the soil. Um, but as many, many other components of the system will attest, um, there are trade-offs. And I'm going to show you one, uh, which is, uh, shows sort of a, an opposite benefit uh, problem of equation uh, as, as compared to this one for hydrology. Okay, for hydrology, it was led by Fred Pearson and Jane, Jason Williams of ARS. Um, we did these artificial rain experiments, and these were this is a, really a massive uh, logistical uh, study. And um, we did these artificial rains where we uh, where we did our cuttings and uh, various treatments, and then measured sediment uh, transport and runoff. Well, first of all, before we even did any experiments, um, if you look at the picture in the lower right, um, that's pretty classical phase three woodlands. And so the, um, the graph indicates that the, the, the black circles indicate the shrub interspace, which is that area in the photo between the uh, trees where you see no understory. And then the tree coppice, the clear circles rep are represented. If you look underneath each tree, you see the, the litter fall underneath those trees. This graph represents the relationship between the percent bare soil and rocks in on a hill slope uh, and the sediment yield. And so 
as the percent bare soil gets much above about 60 percent, and that generally occurs only uh, when you have these uh, phase three encroachments, um, then sediment yield really takes off. And that shrub interspace yields uh, progressively more, almost exponentially more sediment uh, as that percent bare soil rock increases. So this is the problem uh, from a hydrological perspective, and this is why um, we have uh, wanted to go in and treat these uh, systems, remove the trees, and see what happens to the hydrology. Now, what happens when we treat? Well, here's a graph, just one of many that the hydro people have produced between cumulative runoff and sediment yield. And I just want to point out one quick thing. This is short-term experiment. So the black filled objects, symbols, uh, the circles and, and triangles represent burned areas, trees and shrub interspaces. Whereas the uh, clear and the gray symbols represent uh, either un cut, unburned, or, uh, or shredded, or cut, uh, the non-fire uh, situations. And you see that uh, the, the relationship between cumulative runoff, that's for, for a given amount of water, how much sediment was yielded, it's, it's almost the same all the way across the runoff spectrum. So it's not really a problem. You get big amounts of runoff coming down, you're not going to carry a lot of sediment out of that site. But once you burn it, you do. And this is, again, a problem with burning in the short term. And this, what this illustrates is that the you know, treatments like the shredding treatment um, have real benefits hydrologically, because probably because they intercept uh, uh, hill slope flow and don't allow as much of that sediment to come down the slope when you have runoff. Uh, and so they're good hydrologically. Even though we saw at Stansbury, they weren't so good in terms of fire severity. On the other hand, a prescribed fire, which is very important to decrease fire severity, does have short-term hydrological problems in, in, in terms of the relationship between cumulative runoff and sediment yield. But remember these data are short-term, one year after treatment, and we need to uh, go back in, and we're planning to go back in five or six years later now and we measure these. See what's happened. All right, the, the other main treatment effect we see uh, when we remove trees in these woodlands is that um, is water production. And we're really opening a window of opportunity in terms of water when we remove those transpiring wicks from the landscape. And this graph shows, if you look just the left-hand side of the graph, year two, you're looking at the additional wet days in the spring for phase one, two, and three uh, woodlands. These were woodlands that were formerly phase one, two, and three. I mean, we removed the trees uh, in each of the phase groups. And uh, if you look at eight sites there, the sites, uh, two letter acronyms, you can see the same pattern across those sites. And uh, you can see, first of all, that uh, for phase one, you're getting on average, a bit of extra water, probably not much more than an average of about five additional wet days with phase one, because the trees just weren't dominating. Most of the water had already been captured, was being captured by the herbaceous and shrub layer. But in phase two, where trees were formally dominating more, you, they were capturing, the trees were capturing a lot more of that available water less so the herbaceous, less so the shrubs. And you can see that the release of water was much higher for phase two. In fact, we're getting as much as 20 days of extra water at Marking Corral with phase two. It looks like the average is around 15. For phase three, it's even more extreme. And you look at the maximum of 26 extra water days at the Marking Corral site MC for phase three and it goes down for some of the other sites, but it's generally over 20 extra days of water, which is a phenomenal amount of water in the spring, almost a whole month of extra water. That's year two after treatment. If you look at year four after treatment, the, the situation is, has stabilized, and almost all the sites are almost exactly the same. You get, for phase one, four years after treatment, you get phase one, essentially no effect. 
essentially what's happened after four years is that that little bit of extra water that uh, had been released in phase one situations has now been captured. Whereas in phase two, we're, we're up at about uh, seven or eight extra days of water still. And in phase three, we're still over 15 for all sites. So if you project this out into the future, it looks to us like it may take eight to 10 years for this extra water availability to disappear, essentially through capture by competing vegetation. What's going to capture it? What, who is going to capture the water? Only time will tell. Now I'm going to switch gears a little, just show a few floor points and talk about just the general vegetation response, focusing on bunch grasses for the woodland sites, those that were cut and burned. And here's an Anaki cut subplot, a photo taken in 06, which is prior to cutting. And notice the bunch grass size there. And then look at uh, 2007, one year later, after the trees have been cut down. And you can see the individual bunch grasses are bigger. Um, and in 09, they're bigger yet. And that's the kind of pattern we're getting three and four and five years after treatment. We get these bunch grasses continuing to expand. And of course, the, the, more, the, the greater cover of trees that were there prior to cutting, the more water will be available for capture by this kind of vegetation. One would expect that if, if perennial bunch grasses were the only thing that was there, they're going to get very large and possibly even recruit more individuals uh, as the years go by. Uh, so far, however, it's mainly uh, increased size of bunch grasses and not uh, increased colonization. If we look at a burn plot, uh, also from Anaki, there's the pre-burn in 2006, upper left. Same subplot burn one year later, and you see the suppression of the size of bunch grasses. They're still there, but they're suppressed. And in 2009, three years after the burn, you can see them starting to come back. And as a matter of fact, what we're seeing with most sites is that burning is bringing our bunch grasses back to their normal size, to their pretreatment size after about three years, and then they'll start to uh, presume to get larger after that. Okay, now, this kind of a pattern was reasonably consistent across the network, but the balance between the uh, you know, a response of cheatgrass and the responses of these native perennials really depended upon the site and the treatment. Um, in this particular case that you see here at Onaki, bunch grasses were really running the show. Um, pretty safe site, um, cheatgrass not a problem. But at lower, warm, dry Wyoming big sage, cheat has the upper hand short term, especially after the fire, less after mechanical, but definitely um, these are riskier sites. The warmer and drier the site, the more cheat has the upper hand in terms of response. At cooler, wetter Wyoming Big Sage, the cheat and bunch grasses response, uh, response are more balanced. And at most, most mountain Big Sage, but not all, bunch grasses were more dominant. Also, at most woodland sites, the phase effects are modest short term. Uh, and so what, what's really happening is that one good thing is that many of our phase three subplots have not responded really negatively yet. Um, we're not seeing real big problems at most of our sites with these formerly phase three woodlands. However, the phase effects right now are still subtle because um, it's only been three or four years after treatment, and there's still a lot of available water to be captured by those phase three, uh, formerly phase three woodlands. So who knows how these sites are going to diverge with time, you know, at least until that water is used up. And one other thing to think about um, uh, on when we think about the vegetation and uh, the other values we have out there is that all treatments, including both fire and mechanical, um, decreased biological cr uh, crust. They did not eliminate it, but definitely decreased it. And this is a potential trade-off we need to think about. All right. 
I'm going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about Mazepic, the emergent herbicide that we use to go after cheatgrass. This is a set of photo points taken uh, in 2007 in, in 2010 at Rock Creek up on Hart Mountain, and you can see the effect of um, uh, that, uh, that that plateau had uh, on this particular site. This was a site that was mowed, and then uh, imazepic was applied. Um, cheatgrass cover dropped down to one thirtieth of where it was. As you can see, the imazepic was applied manually because of the small scale of the subplots, and the, you can see the application right down below. Now, the Mazepic effect was persistent, um, up to four, in some cases, five years. Um, if you look at the upper graph, cheatgrass cover, really depressed, now starting to come up after four years. Um, there is a bit of a trade-off, Sandberg's bluegrass, which is a, a shallow-rooted uh, perennial bunch grass, was significantly impacted by plateau in, at years one and two. But now uh, those systems have stabilized. So there, there is a potential for trade-off with, um, with uh, Imazepic for uh, other components of the system that we desire to have there. And so deep-rooted native perennial bunch grasses have seized much of this annual resource, at least at some of our sites. But at other sites, this has not occurred. And we're concerned that this Imazepic window of opportunity is going to, going to get filled back in with cheatgrass at some of our sites. All right, and just another look at the same thing that, uh, and I just point your attention to the the um, the triangle that's upright triangle, the fire against a Mazepic uh, triangle represented by the top line. Uh, you see the treatment time there just after summer zero, and you see what nitrate does um, over time. And um, the reason why it does this, of course, is that the combination of fire and amazepic um, is providing a lot of nitrate. Fire produces a lot of nitrate and ammonium. And then the amazepic doesn't allow the cheatgrasses to come back, back in and capture it. So at least out to the fifth sampling period, the spring there, spring five, we have got a lot of nitrate availability there has not yet been captured. Again, this is a window of opportunity. And what's going to capture it? Well, time will tell. All right, I'm going to shift gears now to carbon management and talk about sequestration and a potential trade-off of vegetation. Everybody wants to sequester carbon. And the best way to sequester it is below ground. We know that. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Also, um, if we manage for carbon, do we also manage for vegetation? How, how uh, similar are our outcomes? And uh, how similar can our goals be if we manage for carbon versus vegetation? And I think I'm going to suggest that they're one and the same thing. That if we manage for perennial bunch grasses and healthy sagebrush step systems, we're going to do the best we can in terms of carbon sequestration. If you look at these two graphs here, uh, one on the one on the top, pre-burn ecosystem carbon, I just want to focus a little on the um, the different components of carbon in that system. You have above ground green, litter is yellow, roots are orange, and soil is red. Where we want to put most of the carbon is in the soil because that's where it's most stable. We know that if we burn this system, especially at 100% potential tree cover, we're going to lose most of that above ground carbon. It's going to go into the atmosphere. And if you look at the graph on the bottom, it does go into the atmosphere. We also lose all our litter. The yellow is gone. We also lose some of our root carbon with a very intense fire. And even more worrisome, if you look at the far right hand of the graph on the right, and look at the amount of carbon, the megagrams per hectare of carbon, and compare it to the top, just at the 100% mark, you'll see that there's a lot lower amounts of carbon in the soil. And that's probably because with really intense fires out at that, uh, you know, standard replacement fires that are fully encroached phase three woodlands, uh, we're getting uh, some impacts into the soil. We're getting carbon removed from the soil, which is not a good thing. 
this graph shows the same thing except what would happen if we have a single wildfire, which is the single uh, uh, solid line kind of going up uh, from left to right and then suddenly drops down at the end. That's our fire that occurs at 100% potential tree cover. But if we have three prescribed fires and we hit this, the site with prescribed burning, when the percent of potential tree cover is only about 28% and we keep hitting it three times, we save some of that, uh, some of the tons of carbon per hectare of below ground about four micrograms per hectare by our estimates, and that's indicated on the right. So the standard replacement fire that happened at 100 percent makes that soil carbon dive down below that baseline that's just a little below 60, whereas the repeat fires keep that uh, soil carbon above that line. The difference, four micrograms per hectare. That is a lot of carbon when you look at how many hectares we have out there in the landscape. Now, the other thing is that I want to emphasize about carbon is that in terms of uh, if you compare healthy sagebrush step with cheatgrass systems, you can see that in the black above ground, of course, there's a lot more biomass above ground, but we're most concerned with below ground. And if you look at below ground, because of the more extensive root systems of intact stage by step systems, especially the bunch grasses, you're seeing a much greater uh, amounts, uh, metric tons per hectare um, in the soil, in the roots, um, in these uh, bunch grass systems than you do in the cheatgrass. And that difference between the black and the, and the gray on the right hand side is substantial. That, combined with the previous graph I showed you, leads to some interesting conclusions. So, for example, if we manage stage steps so that the area converted to cheatgrass that we know is being converted every year was reduced by just 10% each year, we would offset 0.9 to 0.44 million metric tons of CO2 emissions annually. And that's roughly equivalent to the annual emissions of the entire fleet of vehicles operated by the DOI. Now, I'm not saying that we can reduce the cheatgrass invasion, the progression over the years by 10%, but if we could, um, that would be the payoff. So the question, can treatments like these restoration treatments, can they alone actually accomplish a goal like this? Can we get that 10% reduction? And the question two, you know, we focus on cheatgrass, do we lose options for other, other values? And those are important questions that Sage Step really has yet to answer. All right, switch gears here again to sage grouse. We don't study sage grouse. It's, uh, this bird has huge home ranges, and uh, we can't really study it experimentally, but um, we can study it. Uh, from a habitat perspective. This is a BLM map that I got online. Shows the sage grouse breeding density areas. And if you look at the stars, the green stars, those where our sage step sites are. You can some of some of them you can see are uh, very close to some of the big uh, the red areas that are the most intense sage grouse breeding density areas. So that's good. Okay, now, and when we measure a vegetation, so we're looking at habitat now for sage grouse, we know that we can see that both prescribed fire and mechanical treatments increase the abundance of food plants that greater sage grouse chicks are known to prefer, a lot of forbs. And both uh, fire and fire surrogate treatments increase the cover of native perennial herbaceous vegetation, and that which is also a key component of greater sage grouse feeding habitat. But, of course, the effects are much stronger in the mountain big sage communities and higher elevation Wyoming big sage. They're not very strong lower down. And an additional caveat is that our findings are relatively small scale compared to the home range size of sage grouse, of course. Sage grouse needs big landscapes, and so to use these kinds of inferences is a little tricky. In addition, restoration treatments that reduce sagebrush, like some of the ones that we're looking at, the prescribed burning treatments, will also trigger a decrease in grouse habitat quality, at least for the short term, because sage grouse is a critical component of uh, 
sagebrush is a, a critical component of sage grouse habitat. So these results should be treated with caution, but at least they're food for thought. Now, another way to look at this is these are the this is a multivariate view of uh, of habitat for greater sage grouse. And so, if you look at the um, if you look at the uh, the range of uh, uh, of habitat in multivariate space uh, along the CCA1 axis that sage grouse occupies. And these are this is a multivariate uh, analysis, so it has a lot to do with the you know the percentage of sagebrush, how much uh, perennial bunch grass, how little cheatgrass, oh, and also stuff like roads and other things that impact habitat for sage grouse. But if you look at the other birds, the birds that we study, which uh, you know you look at brewer sparrow for example, you can see that brewer sparrow has uh, habitat preferences very similar to sage grouse, and so too do sage thrasher and sage sparrow. And so our point here is that we can use these passerines as umbrella species for greater sage grouse. So if the sage uh, step manage uh, restoration treatments positively influence these sagebrush step uh, passerine birds, they may do the same thing at a bigger scale for sage grouse. So these three birds, and we're seeing in our big uh, big plot studies that prescribed fire has very subtle but pause but tending toward positive effects on sagebrush step pass greens in the short term, causing slight shifts in these communities from woodland to sagebrush step. But it's jury is still out on the long term consequences of treatment. These birds take a long time to respond because of fidelity and life their lifespans. It may take a dozen years to say anything. Um, really significant about their response uh, to these kind of treatments. All right, now let's sh shift gears to the uh, biodiversity world, the insects. I'll just talk about butterflies today. And the main question I would ask uh, uh, for, for this kind of work is, do these restoration treatments cause unintended consequences? I mean, if you think about the uh, BLM managing for essentially vegetation and fuels, you know what other components of the of the ecosystem uh, might fall apart if if their focus was just on vegetation and fuels. And in general, uh, butterflies respond positively to um, to fire and fire surrogate treatments. And this is a um, a graph showing the the number of species observed in a given survey, um, the richness um, at the sage cheat sites in response to burning. So no burn, burn. And you can see that, the, um, that there's a significant increase in richness at those burn sites. So most likely burning increases floral resource and tree, treeless sagebrush step. Most likely this is a, uh, um, this is, has to do more with flowers for the adults than it has to do with host plants for the larvae. And this richness, uh, the years since treatment, the richness effect persists at least three years, and, I, and I've already got a, uh, all the way out to five years, and it's still persisting. So it is a persistent effect. And as I said, it's probably a nectar bullseye effect. So it's just probably pulling uh, strong flying butterflies in from the surrounding landscapes. Now, there are some clear larval effects. Um, we believe this is one of them, um, obviously. Juniper hair streak is a juniper feeder, and when you remove its trees, uh, you can see that the, um, the, the green bars are controls where there were no trees removed, and then the other colors are, are uh, burn and mechanical treatments, and you see the decreases. Um, obviously, juniper hair streak uh, numbers are going to decline because you remove the larval host plant. Juniper feeders need juniper. But the other larval effect um, that, um, that we've noticed is to refer to the Melissa blue butterfly, a small blue butterfly. And you see here the effect size of astragalus, and that is the, the difference uh, in, um, in cover post-treatment between the prescribed fire and control and between the mechanical and control for astragalus correlated with the same effect size calculation 
for the Melissa Blue. And you see a positive correlation here. So every, nearly every time that it, it's a stragglers host plant that it, that it feeds on almost, almost entirely, um, increases as a consequence of treatment, so too does the Melissa Blue increase as a consequence of treatment. And this is the um, one of the only strong plant-butterfly relationships we've discovered in this study. Uh, undoubtedly, we'll find more. Uh, but this sort of illustrates the fact that you know, butterflies are going to go along with the vegetation. Um, they're linked to the native host plants. And we should expect that what happens to those native host plants is probably going to happen, at least in part, to the butterfly fauna. And the point being that restoration treatments change habitat quality. They're going to make a better habitat for some species and perhaps worse habitat for others. Um, taken over a landscape level, if we do, don't do everything the same everywhere, uh, we're going to be just OK, especially with, these, uh, with, with fire treatments, the, the kind of uh, disturbances that these kinds of critters uh, have evolved. All right, now I'm going to shift gears again and talk a little bit about public acceptance and trust, um, some of our socio-political work. And I just want to make the comment that um, there's a high public acceptance of most of these restoration treatments. And you can look at the numbers there from 89 down to 77 percent covering um, you know, four different types of treatments, prescribed fire, felling, mowing, and livestock grazing. Uh, chaining and spraying herbicides, much lower acceptance, but for the most part, the mainline restoration techniques are accepted by the public. Um, the troubling thing about this graph is that the trust levels uh, that the public have, you know, in the BLM and Forest Service and actually implementing these treatments is much lower. Uh, and it's, uh, for our various reasons for that, probably not uh, certainly not all due to the, our region, but can be political uh, things happening at the national scale. But uh, certainly those trust levels could be higher. We could uh, definitely do better with those. And finally, on ranch economics, we did a lot of different economics uh, studies, but this is on ranch economics. And uh, um, we, we found that ranchers uh, operating on healthy rangeland have sufficient private incentive to maintain rangeland health. Um, so if you've already got a good healthy system, it pays to keep it healthy. But ranchers operating degraded on degraded rangeland will only pursue rehab if treatment success rates are improved or if current treatment costs are reduced. So we don't have good success rates now for uh, degraded lands, and our treatment costs are too high. And so ranchers probably aren't going to treat, even, even though their systems are degraded, which is going to sort of continue on, on down the spiral. And also, if ranchers do not understand the relationship, the relationships among grazing pressure, veg treatments, and rangeland ecological dynamics, their management will result in higher short-term profits but lower long-run profits and greater ecological degradation, which is a, a recipe for disaster in the long run. All right, I just want to finish up by talking about our outreach. We have a very strong outreach program. Here's a, a, one of the tours we did a few years ago at the, uh, uh, at the Reynolds Creek uh, site, ARS uh, research station. Uh, Leo Gilbert is our outreach coordinator at Utah State. She uh, maintains our website. You can go on that website, safestep.org, and find all kinds of stuff. We believe our gold standards, which we try to do as much as possible, are one-on-one -on -one interaction with clients, between our scientists and clients, and, uh, and field tours. And we do a lot of these, as many as we can. And of course, the research gold standard is the technical paper peer-reviewed, which we have a lot of, and that's really the only uh, the only piece of information that's really defensible. And so, I just wrap up by answering a couple questions here. Can treatments alone actually accomplish the goal of getting a balance between a better balance between cheatgrass and bunch grasses? 
And it, and it depends, of course. For some of the land area, treatments are working. For others, treatments probably won't work by themselves. And for some in the middle, the jury's still out. And if we manage for bunch grass, do we lose options for other values? The answer is, is no. We haven't seen any yet. No, no trade-offs there. Bunch grass seems to be a key to the system. And the bottom line is for every ecosystem component that we measured, four years of post-treatment data is enough to be certain on outcomes for perhaps only 10 to 15 percent of the situations we've encountered. To boost that certainty level up, we need to monitor these treatments out to 10 years post-treatment. And I think we'll, we'll have certainty on the majority of them. And that's really, um, it's really tied to how long it takes for that extra water uh, that is produced after treatment to, to, to be used up and, uh, and captured by the vegetation. Ten years is probably what it's going to take. For, inf for information about SageStep, uh, of course, SageStep.org. Again, the funders, and I also want to thank uh, Janie McMonk in the uh, Science Delivery, Great Basin Science Delivery Project, and Tim Swetberg and the work he's put into outreach, because this is really where the rubber meets the road. We do the research without the outreach, we haven't done anything. So thank you all for your attention, and uh, certainly uh, let me know uh, uh, through. Uh, through our website, uh, our contact information, or give me a call or send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for your presentation. OK, there is a question. How were the additional water days determined following the removal? OK, that, those, um, the, the way we measure soil water is with these data loggers. And uh, we have little gypsum blocks that are uh, that we that we dig into the soil at various depths. And when the gypsum block in the spring, the gypsum blocks are of course all saturated with water. And then at some point in time, when the water leaves the soil at that particular depth, the gypsum block dries up and it gives us a signal. And then when all gypsum blocks at every depth are are dry, uh, we know there's no more water in the soil. And so we can we can um, record um, you know how many days um, uh, before tree removal uh, you know we can record the date um, at which the uh, gypsum blocks went dry and then we can say it's May first and then we remove the trees and then the next year we come by in the same place and record the date that the gypsum blocks go dry and maybe it's you know, May 25th, and that's how we get the 24 extra days. Great, thank you. And another question, were the historic and current grazing regimes pre- and post-treatments for all areas the same? That's definitely not. Uh, it was a wide variety of grazing regimes uh, when we started the study, all the way from no grazing at places like uh, you know, Moses Cooley and the uh, Hart Mountain Refuge to really heavy grazing in places like uh, Blue Mountain and Divine Ridge. Um, and so we constructed fences to stabilize that and uh, had our fences built and, and uh, hoped that, um, that that particular variable would have relatively little influence on our experimental results. But you know, there's no way to control for that kind of a thing. Um, because, you know, of course, the grazing regimes, uh, you know, vary so markedly across the Great Basin. So I think the, um, the, the, the whole idea of grazing, we didn't study it, and it wasn't because we didn't believe it was important. We didn't study it because it was just too difficult to study in, in relation to all the other things we were trying to do. Uh, it would have made the uh, study, it would have changed uh, the study from a, $13 million study to a $50 million study. <laughs> we just didn't have the resources to do it. OK, great. Thank you. Oh, also, once the webinar closes, there'll be a three-question survey. If you wouldn't mind taking it, that'd be great. Um, also, let's see, if you have more questions regarding this webinar or any other topics or have requests for future webinars, please call or email me anytime. Thank you very much, all, um, for your participation today. And thank you so much, Jim, for your presentation. You bet. Thanks, Jenny.
All right. Have a great day, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.